Hey guys, welcome to Big Church Online. We are so excited that you've joined us today. If you're looking for any sermons or words of encouragement, you've come to the right place. While you're here, please subscribe, like, comment, share. That way you can stay up to date and help others find it as well. Now, let's get this week's sermon in progress. But there are so many good stories that people just kind of bask by. You read a Harlequin romance. Anybody even read Harlequin romances anymore? No. Okay, well, good. Y'all are saved. But anyway, <laughs> but there's so many good stories in the Bible that we just bypass. We just go by. But there are so many things that, that we can glean from. And he, here's the good thing. We're finding out that David was a person, even though he was called a, a man after God's own heart, he was just a normal guy. He went through the same things that we went through, and he goes through. The, he went through the whole his whole life struggling with some things and getting victory over some things. But what I want you to know is he was the least of his family, but God chose him. Sometimes you can be the you can be the one forgotten about, but God is always choosing those people. And last week we saw that God saw his heart and he sent him back to the pasture. Why did he do that? You all took notes. You should know, because the pasture is not for punishment. So many times we treat it as, oh man, I'm going out here into the wilderness. And, and, but no, there's, there's things that God wants to show us. But the pasture, it could be a time of correction and preparation if we allow it to be. Remember what I said last week? If we're complaining and griping and grumbling all the way through, he's going to say, okay, you want to stay in the pasture a little bit longer? I'm going to leave you here till you learn your lesson. But listen, what the pasture does, as we'll see next week, it turns obstacles into opportunities. It helps you to see things a whole lot differently than you saw before. So many times it takes that alone time with God to get to a place to see his perspective, to change your perspective. Come on, there's so many distractions in the world today. There's so many things that you could be coming on to. You could see, I mean, the TVs and, and phone. I mean, phones are bad enough. How many about almost wrecked this week on your phone? Come on, get your hands in there. You're lying because you did. You were texting. You shouldn't have been. Me too. I'm that guy that is at the, you know why I don't get mad at the people at the stop sign, stoplight that don't go? Because I'm that guy. I'm on my phone. With, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, excuse me. You know, they're honking at me. But sometimes we live our lives so much in distraction mode that we can't allow God to take us to the pasture, to the place where only he can speak to us. But here we see David's first big assignment. And you got to remember He's the king, right? He's been chosen, sent back to the pasture. He was anointed by Samuel as the king. And his first big assignment is this. Let's look at 1 Samuel. One day, Jesse, his dad, said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain and see how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they're doing. David's probably saying, do what? So let me ask you a question. You want me to take cheese? You want me to take bread to those guys? You want me to give you a report? Don't you remember how bad they treated me? But what he had to do, he had to fight through the feelings. Come on, I'm going somewhere. He had to fight through the feelings to get to the facts. He could have reacted to his feelings. He could have said, hey, dad, take it yourself. He said, I really don't even like none of those guys. They've never treated me good. Look how they, look, what have they ever done for me? He could have allowed his insecurity to come up. He could have, he felt invisible. He could have allowed hurt and rejection. Hey, he's like, dad, I'm right here. And you didn't even acknowledge me. You didn't invite me to the party. I'm right here. I live in the same house. I'm your son. And he also faced doubt. I really don't fit in. I don't have the qualifications to be the king. All those things started coming up in his feelings. And how about you? Have you allowed your past mistakes? Have you allowed your past disappointments? Have they made you believe that you don't have what it takes? Come on, somebody. You got the enemy talking in your ear, and he's reminding you of every mistake you've ever made. He's telling you you're not qualified because of the... Y'all are quiet this morning. You know I'm speaking the truth this morning. He, he, he keeps hitting rewind and, and play and rewind and play. And he keeps bringing these things together into your minds. Do you have to fight through your feelings? Or do you handle things through your feelings? Oh, no. Our feelings, if you haven't known yet, can get you in a lot of trouble. Can y'all know what I'm talking about? 
They said this about me. They might not have even, I think Johnny said this, they might not have even said that, but when you get into your feelings, you start hearing things that you don't really hear. Come on, I don't feel like going to work. Well, tell that to LG and E. Tell that to your mortgage company. I don't feel like going to work today. Well, you gotta go. Sometimes you gotta fight through your feelings to get to the facts. Our emotions lie to us. Our feelings lie to us. That's why we have to stand on the word of God to be able to go forward in everything that we do. The facts were that David, he had to humble himself. He had to fight through all of his feelings because he knew he had an assignment. Let me hear what, let me, the title of my message is this. I said all that to get to the title. Is there something, I'm going to challenge you. Is there something worth fighting for? 1 Samuel chapter 17 says this. So David rose early in the morning and he left. Say left. left. Come on, all three of you said left. Say left. left. He left the sheep with a, comforter, with a keeper and he took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the armies were going out to fight and shouting for battle. We're going to talk about the battle next week. Israel and Philistines had drawn up a battle array, army against army. Y'all, oh man, gladiator, y'all. Johnny, I don't want to talk about it. The Bible is better than any movie you could watch. Come on. Amen. Army against army. And David left. Say that again. Left. He left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper. And he ran to the army. And he came and he greeted his brothers. Number one. Will you fight for your assignment? You may have to serve mac and cheese to people you don't even like to get to your bigger opportunity. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You might have to humble yourself and serve mac and cheese to someone you don't even like. You may have to do things for people who've looked over you. This is for somebody in here this morning. You, they may have looked over you. Maybe they've spoken badly about you. Maybe they've treated you wrong to get to your assignment. Who knows? They may even be your assignment. You might be sitting right next to your assignment right now. Yes, she does really feel like an assignment to me. I got to work overtime on him. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. All husbands are looking at their wives right now, and the wives are like, yeah, you are my assignment, that's for sure. But you may be sitting right next to your assignment. You may be looking for what God wants you to do out there, and he's got something for you to do right here. So many times we look over the obvious things that we're doing to try to find something bigger and better. God said, no, 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 be faithful. I'm not getting ahead of myself, but be faithful over the small, and I'll make you ruler over much. David would have never met his real assignment if he had not obeyed his father. Our opportunities are wrapped in obedience. Nobody wants to talk about being obedient anymore. We live in a world that does whatever the heck they want to do. But obedience Submission and discipline leads you to new assignments. But obedience always doesn't require the details. God, I'll do it if you'll tell me. Abraham, I want you to get up out of your country, which he was rich. And I want you to go look at that land out there. And I want you to go. Okay, God, where am I going? I'm going to tell you when you get there. I mean, you got to admit, you got to know this guy had all kinds of money. So I'm going to tell you when you get there. Okay, well, what are we going to do then? He says, just you got to go. Sometimes you just have to go. Yeah. Noah, I need you to build a boat. A boat? What's that? It hadn't rained in 120 years. <laughs> they were 300 miles away from the nearest body of water, and you want me to build a Titanic cruise ship? These people are going to think I'm cray-cray. But he said, I want you to start putting your hand to what I tell you to do, and I'll work out the details later. Sometimes the details are in the going. The things we can do are normal, or we have to pray, and we have to serve, and we have to read, and we, and we need to give. But sometimes the smallest details are part of your bigger assignment. Look at Luke 19, 17. It says this. He said, good servant, great work. Because you have a trend trustworthy in the small job, I'm going to make you governor over 10 towns. You've been, you've been faithful to come to church. You've been faithful to do what God's asked you to do. You haven't been grumbling about it. So God says, okay, because you've been faithful over the small things, 
I'm going to make you ruler over many things. God wants to give you the opportunity to move up, to go higher. But sometimes you just have to finish what you start. It says he left his sheep with the keeper. He left his supplies with the keeper. No good shepherd ever leaves his sheep unattended. Oh, that could preach for like two hours right there. God has trusted us, not just the pastors of this church, but he's entrusted you to feed his sheep, to tend his sheep, to be, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus to someone who may not know who Jesus is. That's why this church is very inclusive. We want everyone to know that Jesus loves them. Jesus has a plan for their life. And listen, once you get a relationship, then you can start talking about what do we need to fix? The first thing they do when they start coming into some churches, they want to fix you. Well, you didn't get that way overnight. And you ain't going to get fixed most of the time overnight. Come on, I know I keep saying the same things, but sometimes we got to hear it more than once to get the full effect. But we have to love people through their pain. We have to love people through their process. We have to love people through, because you know what? Sometimes we can't forget we've been in the process. Oh, so many times I see Christians, oh, I can't even go there, looking down their noses at people, but they have forgotten where they came from. Well, your struggle is this. Yeah, but your struggle wasn't that, but don't you remember where you were 10 years ago? Oh, help me, Lord. David's assignment is about to change because he's willing. Skill, talent, connections, they're going to help you for a little while. But God can do more with a willing person than a talented person. A person will just say yes to him. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it, God. No, I may not be able to sing and I may not be able to do these things, but I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do to get to the place where you want me to be. He takes willing over talent. Here's what David was. He was about to be reassigned right in the middle of his assignment. God, you already got me doing something. Well, we're about to change course here, David. Here's what we're going to do now. Verse 23. Then as he talked to them, all his brothers and all the people came out. There was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. Everyone else, he'd been out there screaming. I'm going to talk a little bit next week. Threats. Finally, David comes up on the scene and he heard him. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled for him, for they were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you not seen this man who's come up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give him his father's exemption from taxes. Wait a minute, David's like, I'm going to get money? I'm going to get a babe? And I ain't going to have to pay no taxes. Come on, sign me up for something. I don't know what we're going to do. I like those three things already. Verse 26. And David spoke to the men who stood by saying, What shall be done to this man who kills the Philistines and takes away his reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? David was about to get fired up. That he should defy the armies of the living God. Now Eliab, you remember he was the older brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Oh, he's trying to talk down to David right now. I know your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And I love what David says it right here. And David said, what have I done now? Y'all are always finding something wrong with me. What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he towards towards him and to the other and said the same thing to these people and answered them to the first. There was something in David worth fighting for. Number two, who and what are you fighting? Remember in verse 30, he says, David turned away from his brother. The enemy will always create a new enemy. Come on, you get over one enemy, there's always going to be something else out there. Because he's always trying. Why does he do that? Because he wants you to divert yourself from the real enemy. The Bible says we, we fight not against flesh and blood, but yet we're fighting with each other all the time. 
but against principalities and spirits. We're fighting against a spiritual war that we're in right now. But he, what he wanted him to do is he wanted to see his brother as the enemy. And sometimes distractions keep you from seeing the real battle. The enemy was trying to distract him because Goliath was the battle out there. Discouragement stands in your way of your purpose. You've got to learn how to tune out. You've got to learn how to tune out those people that are trying to keep you. They're trying to steal you. They're trying to set back and they're trying to divert your purpose. You've heard the saying, mind over matter. Well, I say I don't mind because your opinion don't matter. Everybody's full of opinions. Just ask them. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You start talking to people, and all of a sudden they'll start trying to fix your problem. And sometimes it's worse when they try to fix your problem. It's like, I've already tried that one. It's not working for me. Well, in my opinion, I didn't ask for it. When you know God's assignment, listen to me. There are going to be negativity or negative people around you. And there's going to be attacks. When you start... Oh, some of y'all started, just started following Christ again. It's been hard, right? Yeah, you can nod your head yes. You're in church. You're fine. It's been hard because you've got a target on your back now. The enemy knows that you used to be in darkness. Now you're in light. So he's going to try to throw all the darkness that he can at you every day, every week. But when you know your purpose, you can stand firm in God's plan, knowing that his plan is so much greater than what's coming against you. Bible says David turned away. I would have been, come at me, bro. Come on. I remember how you treated me. I'm about to, I'm about to punch you in the face. Come on, y'all like to punch your brothers and sisters in the face. I was the oldest. I was the oldest, and I'm going to tell you one thing right now. I treated my brothers and sisters bad. It's a wonder my little brother made it to 50 years old because I used to beat the tar out of him. And then I would say, I didn't really do anything, but... David could have said, come at me, bro. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't attack back. And that's a hard one. But sometimes you can't fight someone or something you shouldn't be fighting. He walked away from that obstacle towards his assignment. So many times the obstacle's in front of us, it diverts us from what God wants to do. He could have had him fighting with his brother for the next two hours. But yet there was a Goliath out there, come on somebody, that needed to be challenged. David decided, listen, I'm not listening to you. I'm going to bypass the negativity, and I'm going to walk away from this obstacle toward my assignment. you got to stay focused on the mission and the purpose. David said in verse 29, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Think about David. He came up on the scene as an observer, but he couldn't stay that way. Listen, when the Spirit of God gets hold of you, you can't sit on the sidelines anymore. He's sitting there and he's watching all these grown men say, oh my gosh, we're so scared. Look at how big this guy is. And he's like, hey, wait a minute. Have you forgot? I'm not getting ahead to next week, am I? But have you forgot the God that we serve? He, this man is nothing. Sometimes you have to just get in the game. He challenged them. He said, what's our purpose? What do we stand for? And I'm here to challenge you this morning as Christian people of God. What is our purpose and what do we stand for? Is there not a cause? Is there not something worth fighting for? The world pickets, the world protests, they camp out, they speak out. And let me tell you what, that's a small percentage of people, but they're being heard loudly. What are we fighting for? What are they fighting for? They're fighting for their own ideology. They're fighting for what they believe is right. But the world accepts what society says because it doesn't know the truth or it's rejected the truth. The Bible says in the last days are like sheep that have been led to the slaughter. The Bible says also we are perishing from lack of knowledge. The world wants you to believe everything it wants to believe. And it, oh my gosh, it's so much. You need to be praying over these young people right now because they're being indoctrinated into things that, that is just crazy. I know, you got a sweating ball preacher up here, but you're going to get in the facts this morning. Will you take a stand when no one else will? Can I just tell you this morning, Christianity today is not popular. Church, will you come to church when no one else will? That's the pastor talking to me, come to church. 
Church in the world today is not even relevant. Morality in the world today we live in today is subjective to you do you and I'll do me. What are we Christians? What are we passionate about? Where is our voice? I remember a few years ago, Chick-fil-A was standing on some issues, and you they were lined up miles down the Gene Snyder, miles down the roads to get a free Chick-fil-A sandwich to show support, and we can't get 15 people to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. What are we passionate about? What are we passionate about? You want a free chicken sandwich, or you want to set, see somebody set free? Oh, let's go on before I, I got my boots on this morning. We're good. God aligns us with causes that bring him glory. Number three, who are we fighting for? I remember when we started the refuge, you're going to get a little summary here. Oh, we're good. We got two hours. We're good. When we first started, Pastor Mindy and I wanted a church called the refuge for people like us that had been divorced that had been down and out, that had been looked down by everybody else in the church. I never thought I'd preach again. We wanted a church for people like us. And we got our vision and we did that. We went knocking on doors. We got a little storefront in Mount Washington. And, and, and about in the middle of August, no, it was about July, a friend of ours came down and he said, in the middle of us telling him his our, our vision, he said, hold on just a minute. I see thousands of young people around you. I went, bless his ever-loving heart. I'm like, I'm X amount of years old. I don't really want to be a youth pastor. He said, I see it. Fast forward to September, we opened up the church, and about 35 or 40 of our closest friends and people from other churches came and supported us, and we were on fire. We had 42 people on our first service. We were great. Next service, zero. Six o'clock rolled around, 6.05, 6.10, and I'm like, Okay, God, did we miss this? What, what's going on? Fear and doubt started coming in. And our 15-year-old at that time says, you think maybe it was because Donnie said it was supposed to be for young people? <sighs> Out of the mouths of babes right there, come on. So we started saying, what does that look like? And I will tell you, I'll fast forward. About 12 weeks later, we had 150 high school kids coming and jam jamming packed that little storefront. It's all because we did not let the obstacle stand in our way. Listen, I, I thought I'm not cool enough to be a youth pastor. I, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty cool, though. Uh, just ask me. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not this and I'm like that. But when God gives you the opportunities, you just have to go with it. Who are we fighting for? Because we're not qualified. But listen to what 1 Corinthians says this. It says, God has chosen the foolish things of the world. Maybe you're sitting out there saying, I'm not qualified, but listen to this. The foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. They'll never make it. And all the churches around there really didn't like us because you know why? We were impacting the kingdom of God. I was like, I'm going to shut my, I had to shut my ears to the, to the thoughts of, oh, they're a cult or they're this, that. And I had to shut my ears to all those things or we would have closed down. He put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world. God wants the weakest. He wants you not just to be weak. He wants you to be weak in him. So, okay, God, I can't do this in my own, but with you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We made many mistakes, and listen, but Psalms 37 says this. The steps of a good man or woman are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. He delights in your steps, even if they're sideways. Come on, y'all, not everybody goes forward, right? Even if they're small, he delights in your way and says, though he fall, he doesn't say that you may fall. He says, no, you're going to fall from time to time. He shall be utterly be, but he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. It doesn't say how many steps it takes to get from point A to point B, because my life has been point A. Okay, let's go. Oh, hold on a minute. I'm going to go around this pole a couple times. I'm going to go up here. There's, there's Z. Hold on a minute. Dang it. I'm going to run around this. Come on, has that been your life too? He's got A to Z for you, but we take every other detour instead of taking a step forward. And listen, I'm not talking down to you. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me this morning because I took many detours to where God wants me to be today. Don't let your past journey keep you from your new destination. 
God's got a great plan for your life. He's got a place that he only wants you to be. Don't let what you've done in the past bring you to a place where you can't go forward in him. And when we talk about youth, in verse 33, he says this. You are not able. This is the king. This is the guys talking to him. You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight, for you are youth. They were pretty much saying to him, don't send a boy to do a man's job. But can I tell you something this morning? Don't underestimate the power of this generation. Don't underestimate the power of our, high, our middle school and our high school and our college age. Don't underestimate the power because let me tell you what, there is power in that. So many times we as seasoned Christians have looked over them because they don't. Listen, you need to glean. That's why we need all generations. We need the older generation to pour into the younger generation. We need the younger generation to tell us how to use our iPhones. I can't tell you the times I've had to hand my electronics to someone that's in here, fix it. And within 10 seconds, they fix something I've been working two hours on. Well, what would happen if we became the adults that they needed to be? What would happen if we became the examples they needed to be? The leaders, the parents. We got too many grandparents raising their grandkids. I knew I was going to get in trouble. Minnie's not here to tell me to slow down. <laughs> All generations need a push in the right directions. Listen, our young people are crying out for someone to care. You may not think they're listening to you. You may want to kill your middle schooler. Come on, I'm just being, I mean, I'm being truthful. Sorry. But they are listening to you more than you think that they're listening to. They're watching you more than you ever could know. You don't want them to say a word? Don't say that word in front of them. You can say it on the Gene Snyder, but not in front of them. I'm, that's a joke. Don't say it on Gene Snyder because Jesus is watching. But do we really care? Do we really care if our young people, our sons and our daughters... Let me tell you, they don't even know Jesus is anymore. We're living in a culture now today that has taken God just and put him somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And we don't even teach our kids the values of who God is. Listen, do we care that they're roaming aimlessly without direction? I found out when we were in Mount Washington, but from three to six o'clock in the after, from three o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock in, in the evening were very, very hard times because we had latchkey kids. I talked to several of them. What do y'all do from three to six? We smoke weed for three hours. We're doing all these things. And when mom and dad gets home, they have no clue what's happened because they've left their kids aimlessly by themselves. Can I just tell you this one thing? If things don't change, it's going to affect our future. It already has. We see families falling apart at, at just numbers like crazy. We see addictions. And, and listen, my wife told me she learned this at camp. She said, kids are bullying as low as elementary school, it's a thing called body shaming. They're intimidating the smaller ones to the point that suicide rate has increased. Do you know the suicide rate for a 15 to a 24 year old is the highest that it's been? And that's the one that's, that's the one the enemy is targeting right now. I often say, man, what does a 12 year old have to be worried about? Well, they have a lot more to worry about than what you think they do anymore. We need to be praying for this generation. Do you know why? Because the other generation is going to take your seat one of these days. There's a generation that's going to go forward and go farther than you ever could go. The next generation is really the now generation. If we don't redo or reach the truth of God's word, the, world, the world's going to get them. If we, don't put our, if we don't be the parents that we need to be, the grandparents we need to be, the examples, the world is going to grab hold of them because there's so many things that are out there. Listen, you saw last week about how hungry our youth are, how passionate they are. And listen, we're, that's our goal is, is this year is to really reach this generation. We're in reaching to try to get a bigger outreach out there. But you saw that. But let me tell you what over the next few weeks we're going to talk about. We need a youth pastor. We need someone who can be pretty much a full time to get into the schools and get in. We need one of them. So I'm going to ask you to be praying that the right person at the right time will be allowed. I'm just going to be other. I've been real all day. We need the money. I can't get somebody to come in here and work for nothing, to be honest with you. 
So many people do sacrifice for this church and for the thrift store, and I'm so thankful for that. But we need a full-time youth pastor, and we're gonna start getting a, a, a goal towards that starting next week. But I'm gonna tell you this much. Is there not a cause? Is there not something worth fighting for? Listen, sometimes we gotta quit talking about it, and we gotta start being about it. Oh, so many times we sit and talk and we make all the plans and, and we do everything. That's, that's your cue to come up, y'all. Uh, it's time to quit talking about it and being about it. It's time to do more and talk less. And listen, what can we do? And this one's been quoted being church. If you've been in church for a while, you've heard this one. But 2 Chronicles seven fourteen says this. If my people, he ain't talking about the world, He ain't talking about this person. He's talking about if my people, which are Christian people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves. Sometimes you gotta get over yourself to get to where God wants you to be. If they'll pray, and if they'll seek my face, and they'll turn from their wicked ways, he says, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Can I just tell you this much? There are conditions to change the conditions. You can't just flippantly say what you're going to do and, and be who you're going to be. God says, no, there's conditions to see a change in the world that we're in today. You got to pray. You got to seek my face. You have to come after me with all your heart. You want the youth to change, and we have to change our generation. Right. Repentance and prayer and seeking him. But listen to this. You can write this one down. This is good. The pursuit of God leads to knowledge. And knowledge to revelation But revelation requires action. Come on. You can't just know about it. You have to keep seeking God to give you the direction on how to go about it. And then once you know it, you're accountable for it, so you have to go forward in it. You have to take action. There's so many people that first come to Christ and we want them to be perfect. And like, they don't even know. You've been serving God for 40 years. You're still getting it wrong. Come on. Listen, it's God's job to clean up people. It ain't ours. It's ours to, to grab hold of them and love them through their, clean, through their cleaning. Listen, the Holy Spirit can do way, 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 way more than you can ever do. I can tell you that much. That person you've been trying to get to come to church, quit nagging them. Start being a light to them, they'll come to church. That person you've been trying to talk about God and they ain't been listening, stop talking about God and just be light to them. Sometimes people are looking more at your actions than they are at what you can say. We have too many people out there that have talked the talk, but they ain't walking the walk. And people are watching how they're doing it. So I'm telling you this morning, just be light to a darkness. We've got to do this. We have to step out of the church and into the world. This ain't a Sunday meeting, Sunday little gathering here, a, a little community for and no more. We have to step out of these walls into those walls. Because you know why? We've got to get out of our comfort zone. You've got to talk to people that you might not want to talk to. You, gotta, the, you know why? Because the battle's out there. Yes, we battle when we come into church. The, battle, the enemy keeps you from coming to church on Sundays, doesn't he, sometimes? Oh, the car won't start, and the kids are cranky. And I, but the battle is out there. We have to take it to them. God is looking for a generation of young people He's looking for a generation of seasoned people. He's looking for a generation of people that will change their families, their workplaces, their schools, their city, and their world. Can I just tell you this this morning? It wasn't just sheep he was fighting for. It was their livelihood. It wasn't just a giant that he's going to fight next week. It was for a nation. It wasn't just any old battle that you go out there and fight. It was God's battle. Can I ask you this morning, are you ready? This is supposed to be a fired up. If I could give you my best uh, uh, Braveheart, I would right now. I've seen that movie 19 times. But are you ready to join the cause? I ain't talking about a political party, and I'm not talking about an environmental group or the next big thing. Listen, our cause needs to be light in a dark world. Our cause needs to be a voice for those who don't have a voice. Come on, our cause needs to be hope to someone who needs hope. You are are the hope dealer, not the dope dealer. 
I stole that one. That was good. You need to be delivering some hope to somebody out there right now. When they walk up on you, you need to be not telling them what 45 minutes of your bad life. You need to be saying, yeah, I used to be in darkness, <laughs> but now I'm light. I used to be this way. And listen, you may not be there yet, but sometimes you got to prophesy that thing to me. I'm not where I, I need to be now, but I'm not going to stay here. Let's all stand if we can. You know what? Let's leave the lights on. If you don't know Jesus, that's where we start. And sometimes we turn the light. Oh, help me, Lord. You just told me to do this, God. I'm doing it. Sometimes we turn the lights off and we ask people to bow their heads and and we kind of almost hide our way into... This morning, the lights are on. If you don't know who Jesus is, your personal Savior, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand with me this morning. Come on, I see those hands. I see those people who are not afraid to lift their hands with the lights on. Listen, to walk the way Jesus wants you to walk, sometimes you just have to walk out of the darkness into the light. And you may not know the way that you're walking and maybe you don't understand everything about the journey, but God is telling you this morning, if you'll take a step, baby, I'll walk all the way with you. This morning, if you don't know who Jesus is, the altars will be open. The prayer team will be up here on the left and the right. You can find somebody who believe with you, who will pray with you. But sometimes you just got to pray for yourself. Come on, we want the pastor to lay hands on us. We want the prayer team to lay hands on us. Sometimes you just got to lay your hand on and say, Jesus, oh, right now, God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come on, it's as simple as that. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Help me to turn from my wicked ways. I believe that you are, come on, somebody got to hear this. I believe that you are the son of God and that you died on a cross for just me. If it had been only for me, you still would have done it. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and I ask you to make me new. God, I know it may not be overnight. God can do something overnight, y'all. I'm just telling you. He can do something in a split second, but also he can do it in a process. So God, right now, come in and change my heart. Change my mind. Change my attitude. I believe you're the son of God and this morning I accept you as my savior. I'm gonna walk out of here differently than I walked in. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been serving God. Maybe you just lost some hope. Man, I would hope that situation would change or I would hope that this could be different. Come on. God is the one that can restore the hope that you've lost. Maybe you're in a dark place this morning. Maybe you just need God to come and intervene in your life. And listen, maybe you feel like nobody's ever heard you. They've never listened to you. Maybe you feel like you've been overlooked. God is about to give you a voice. A voice to someone that's around you. Come on. I'm not a preacher. You don't have to be. You just have to be light. I'm not an evangelist. You don't have to be. You just need to be that testimony to someone. I've been there. I've done that. And God brought me through it. So this morning... With the lights on, we're having an altar call as they sing this song. And if you want to come down front here just to say, God, I'm, I'm in this to win this. I'm in this to see a generation be changed by the power of God. I'm in this to see these young people's fire not go out. I'm in this to see, I, to see this world changed. So as they get ready to sing this song, if you want to gather around here to show unity, unity has been a big word in our body, to show unity. Come forward. Thank you for joining us today. If you're looking for more information or resources, you can visit mybigchurch.com or follow us on social media at mybigchurch. We love you guys. See you soon.